This is the Real Change Wilmington Podcast, Episode 50, Wheelies on Mulberry Bike Shop, with our guests today, Josh and Terry Slayball. When we're all working together in that building, we feel each other's strengths and weaknesses. But if we all had the same strengths and weaknesses, we wouldn't be flourishing in the same way as just like finding ways for everybody to do what they're good at and to have grace for one another when we don't see eye to eye. What is going on, everyone? This is your host of the Real Change Will Make Some Podcast, Dustin Pierce, joined with my co-host, Tia Harris. Real Change is a positive, constructive, and lighthearted source of local news, events, and resources. On our podcast, we interview leaders of local organizations to help squash rumors and encourage a greater sense of pride in our community. We have a very exciting episode today with Josh and Terry Slayball, who are the owners of Wheelies on Mulberry. We have interviewed them a few times in the past, one when Josh ran for city council. We also did an article in the paper before they opened, and now this is our first podcast with them both Mm -hmm. talking about wheelies since they opened. So it's going to be a good one. But before we get into that, Tira, how are you doing? I'm doing good. We just won our volleyball game on Monday night. That was the last game of the season, so it was good to end on a win. And now I'm looking forward to playing more volleyball, hopefully on a different team soon, because I'm not ready to give it up yet. I got a taste of it. And I want to go Got back. Taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. What have you been up to lately? We did some work on the front of the office. Yes. So that's looking pretty good. And we're preparing it for the corn festival. Mm-hmm. So we're making some corn shaped popsicles, which hopefully make people excited. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully they go well with the kids as well. Yeah. I'm looking forward to like just a bunch of moms buying them for their kiddos and like getting pictures on Instagram and just like showcasing, hey, this is the Corn Festival of Clayton County. There's a lot of good food at the Corn Festival, but not a lot of corn stuff. What was your favorite part of the podcast with Josh and Terry? They had extensive traveling backgrounds, so it was interesting to learn about that. But I think the most important thing was their desire to give back to the community. We interview so many people that have that desire, but it's always good to hear about. It's never repetitive. It's always refreshing to hear. Mm -hmm. So the impression that I had of them after they left the podcast was that they're two great people that care about Wilmington. Yeah, definitely. They definitely do. Yeah. So what did you enjoy most? So I've known them for a little bit Mm -hmm. and they're just like such good, good people. I think one of the questions I asked them was why they have such like a a personal belief in themselves and other people to like take on a project like this where they have no experience in restaurants, no experience in bike shops. Like why in the world would they do this for? And I expected to like hear Josh talk about that because he's like kind of the leader in the whole project and get his insights in it because I'm also like kind of a go-getter or whatever. But Terry kind of took the wheel on that question Mm -hmm. and it was so cool to hear her perspective on it. Yeah. Like just like building up Josh and also just saying, hey, this is not my personality to do any of these things, but how she like supports her husband in that and like is willing to do that. I think that's cool to hear because you hear people all the time who are like risk takers or people who are like scaredy cats. But to be someone who can like be a scaredy cat but support someone, I think is really cool. Yeah, she's character. Been so supportive throughout their entire marriage just based on our conversation. Yeah, I started playing pickleball with them two times now. Really? And they're pretty cool. It's going yeah. well. You should do it. I think Jessica's going to do it. So. I've never played pickleball before. I would be absolutely awful, but well, I should take it. That would be good for point. me. Yeah. Be my opponent. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm super excited. People get to hear their story. If they've never talked to Josh and Terry before, or just know pieces of it. Hopefully this kind of paints the bigger picture and just makes you feel good about wheelies and about Wilmington's community. So without further ado, let's bring in Josh and Terry. Josh and Terry Slaybaugh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good Thanks. to be with you. I've had Josh on here before, but this is the first time that Terry's going to talk. Yep. She was present in the last podcast with Josh and was running for city council, but she was in the background silent, I think. Moral support. Moral support. Cheering me. Yeah. So I'm hoping to hear more about Terry's story in this uh, podcast. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so before we get into Wheelies on Mulberry, we're just going to get a bit of background on you guys, for people who don't know. You guys are probably the most friendly people in Wilmington. It's the we're on the street, so. <laughs> so tell us a story about your guys' life before you met. We come from Northeast Ohio in Amish and Mennonite country. Josh was raised in the Amish community. I was raised in the Mennonite community. And we both grew up on farms. Both went to public schools. Both were really feet down in our churches, really involved in like those communities. 
Both of our families really valued education. I feel like I've learned that over the years, that that was one thing that I think kind of connected us. We both did a good bit of world travel while we were young adults. And then that's kind of through mutual friends, how we met. I think it's fair to say our families both taught us strong work ethics, integrity, mm -hmm. doing things the right way. Yeah, I agree with that. Dealing with integrity was a big part of our lives. Always telling the truth. I think that's probably a staple of the Amish community as far as I know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hard work. It's a good moral to have. Yeah, yeah very right. much a part of the culture and the community there and expectation for mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I have never met anyone that is Amish that is mean or rude. Mm -hmm. They're out there. <laughs> Maybe. I have, but I <laughs> um, I'm glad that's been your experience. Yeah, that's been my experience. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we have great relationships with our families from home, even though we don't live there. We're not attending the same type of church. We have different perspectives on the gospel and scripture and applications and different persuasions, if you will. But we have a mutual respect for each other and how we're choosing to walk out our faith as well, Yeah, I would say. You guys were still Amish and Mennonite when you were married, right? When you got married? I had left the Amish church when we got married and attended her Mennonite church. Mm -hmm. so, so we were Mennonite. We were both Mennonite when we got married. Got married. Yeah. Oh. And stayed members of the Mennonite church for probably 10 years while we were here. Mm -hmm. So just about 10 years ago that we stepped away from that and we're at Dove Church here in Wilmington. It's a fantastic church. I've heard mm -hmm. lots of good things. Good. I think what attracted us there was maybe some of the same values we had yeah. growing up was just simply that it seemed like people there were really focused on strong community and not just self-centered or promoting ourselves or taking care of our own within the church, but actually being focused on what's happening outside of the church seven days a week, not just a performance on a Sunday morning and then be done with it. Exactly. So that was kind of attractive to us when we started going there and try to walk that out as best as we can. You guys were on the same mission trip and then met when you got back, mutual friends. Right. We were in the same region, Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. at the same time, but we didn't really connect there until we came home and a mutual friend introduced us to each other. So how many places did you get to go when you were younger? You that's, said you traveled a lot. That's a hard lot. question. Josh worked with a mission agency where they were based in Thailand, and then you were taking trips into Vietnam, Laos, China, Myanmar, Burma. Cambodia, yeah. yeah. We lived in Thailand, and we traveled basically that whole Southeast Asia area, and we worked with different groups. Some were working with like the underground church in communist countries. Some were working with humanitarian aid groups that were just simply like doctors non, without non borders, non-religious, but were here to help those less fortunate. And so we were able to travel with some of them into the jungles in Northeast Burma or in Tibet and through the Himalayas. Like we did some travel there working with some schools. And so just, I think those experiences really just shape your worldview and you yeah. come back American, you realize the world's a bigger place than what we have here, what we grew up at. There's so many different perspectives on mm -hmm. life and ways to do things, and so many people in the world who really are less fortunate than we are, too, mm -hmm. have less resources. And so to try to apply that to coming back home and dealing with reverse culture shock and then having a friend that introduced the two of us together, we realized, hey, we kind of feel the same way about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. nice. I spent a semester in Bangladesh. I lived with a family and wasn't moving around as much. So I was just in Bangladesh and in India at that time. Was it love at first sight when you guys met? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like Terry was Kent State 4.0, brilliant student, going places in the world. And I'm construction worker. Like, I really liked her. I just felt like she's out of my league. And I think I still feel like that. I'm humbled sometimes that. She decided I'm okay to live with, and we live in Wilmington together. But And it's going to sound really yeah. cheesy, but it was kind of that same thing. Like, I felt like he was, his friends really loved him, and girls loved him, and I felt like we are not in the same camp. And so I think when our paths crossed and we kind of figured out that we were both interested in each other, we didn't date very long. 
Oh, sorry. Right. I kind of did because I was trying to finish school so that I could be completely done at yeah. Kent State and then move here. So I graduated from Kent State in May and moved here in June. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I know, Josh, you're in construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a career, Terry? Not really. Uh -huh. I went to school to teach English, and I had kind of imagined that I would go on to, at that time, you pretty much had to go for your master's degree to teach English as a second language, and I planned to live in another country and teach English. And in the meantime, our paths intersected. I moved here, and... I substitute taught in Wilmington City Schools and really enjoyed that, but I didn't work full time because we could travel more easily and that kind of thing if I wasn't on a real set schedule. And then we had a baby three years into our marriage. I have super extreme pregnancy sickness. And so then we just transitioned to me being a stay at home mom. So, no, I haven't ever really had a career. I'm assuming you enjoy that. I do. I really love it. And I feel like. I do it by choice very much. In the Amish and Mennonite communities, being a stay-at-home mom is really normal. And my mom had to go back to work when I was like a teenager or in my childhood. And I really felt the loss of like her being gone all those hours. I mean, it just like planted a seed in me that if I can stay home with my kids and live, even if I'm eating rice and beans to do that, that it was a priority to me. So... Yeah, you're pretty involved in the community, too, so you do a lot of things. I love that I get to volunteer all over the place, but it doesn't come with the same pressure that a job does. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a sick kid, if you, yeah, want to travel, whatever, there's just more flexibility in it. So, Joshua, what brought you to Wilmington? Initially, a job. I think when I came home from Southeast Asia, I was working for a construction company in Holmes County in Millersburg, and they wanted to branch out into Southern Ohio to reach the housing markets in Dayton, Cincinnati, south side of Columbus. So they offered me a job here in Wilmington because of the location. And I said, sure, I'll do it for six months. Why wouldn't I, you know, try to get it started? And that's what brought me here initially. And after six months, things were going pretty well. We had hired a pretty solid group of employees and the company was growing, and they said, I can either choose to stay here and work here, or I can move back up to Holmes County and give me a job there. And I felt like, honestly, this feels like home. I enjoy it here, and I'll stay indefinitely. So I bought a home, and we got married and raised our family there. And that's what brought me here initially was work. But while we were dating, I was here through the week, and I'd be going up to see Terry on weekends. But it quickly after we got married, this became home. And the longer you're here, you start adding children to the mix and they're going to school and getting involved in sports and your network just starts growing and you realize at some point it shifts. It used to be that you would call where you were raised at home, but somewhere along the line that shifts and this is what we call home and have for quite a few years now. Mm -hmm. That's what initially brought me here. And when did Ellis Fencing start? Well, Ellis Fence has been a company that's been in Wilmington since the mid-1960s. So when I was living here in 2008, the company I was working for here actually closed because of DHL leaving and mm -hmm. the housing market crashed. And so I was given the option, they sold the building here, and I was given the option to move back up north again. and. We talked about it and just felt like, I think we're going to stay here and try our hand at starting our own business, doing construction work. So we started our own business and kept some of the contracts that our former company had, who they weren't interested in keeping anymore, and started our own company doing siding. And then we grew into doing windows and then gutters and eventually Ellis Fence his owner, Kevin, came to us and said he wants to retire. His children aren't interested in the company. He wants to sell it to us. And we were pretty busy with what we were doing already, and we felt like that really doesn't, not really anything we're interested in. But he was really persistent. He kept coming back. And so finally, my business partner and I said, well, why don't we make him an offer and see what he comes back and 
says about that. So we made him an offer. He had to finance us a portion of it, and he had to agree to work for us for a year if we would buy it. And he agreed to those terms. And so in 2016, we actually purchased the Ellis Fence Company. So then we had two separate companies that were running, and we worked with our attorney and merged both companies together and just turned it into an S-Corp. So now it's Ellis Fence and Home Exteriors just because of the reputation that the company had here to not just change everything. We kept the same phone number, website. That all stayed the same. So your customers were still calling Ellis Fence, but we're able to offer more services now than what we did before. So it's probably smart. I mean, you don't want to buy a business and then change its name because you could have just competed. Exactly. With well, yeah. that's what we it's talked about. <laughs> Is it worth it to buy this? If we really want to get into fencing, why wouldn't we just start our own? Yeah. I came back to the local reputation that Ellis had been built on by Kevin and before that by his father who started the company, Paul. It just felt like there's so much good here to be buying. It seems like it's a better route to go than to just start up on our own. So, And I'm glad we did. So my next question is about your role as First Ward City Council member now. So also mm. we interviewed you. That was what you were running for and you got that. Yeah. So can you just recap of why you ran and maybe how things have been going? Yeah, I feel like I've really enjoyed my time on council. It actually began sooner than I expected because there was a resignation and then an open seat and an appointment made, a few of them in a row. And so I was appointed to the seat of First Ward Council August of last year. So I felt like I had a few months of being able to work with the former administration before Mayor Haley's administration came in in January. So even just being able to see the differences and the way things are working has been really good to kind of just learn and see how city government works. But overall, the reason I ran is still the same. It's because I live here and I care about the direction that our city is going. And it felt like a way that I could help with even just the way that we're spending our taxpayers' dollars, the projects that we're investing in, the movement that we're making as a city, just trying to help. And I feel like we actually have a really solid group on council right now who we're going to have differences of opinions, and that's healthy, that's good, because we have seven different perspectives and we talk about it. And then in the end, whether we all agree or disagree, I don't really feel like there's any animosity. I feel like we actually all have the perspective that we're working together for the good of our city and we're going to have disagreements. But then when we're through and we've made a decision, we move on with it and we are ready for the next one that's going to come down the line two weeks later. So <laughs> there's been a lot of decisions recently. Yeah, for sure. Things. And I feel like I'm honored to be able to help with that, to be playing a part. I want to be uh, appreciative of people who did vote and I want to be approachable. I want to have people reach out and let me know if there's questions they have or if there's things to discuss, but I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I've enjoyed seeing you up there. You seem like a very fair person who listens and asks good questions and try to. Sometimes I back myself into a corner or a hole. And it's like, I'm not sure how to respond to this, but I think, like you said, just trying to ask good questions. And sometimes people don't necessarily always have the best way to present the information that they're trying to push and to try to navigate that and hear what they're actually trying to say <laughs> at the core. And maybe not ignore, but try to look past some of the fluff that's out there and get to the meat of the of the question or the discussion or the issue is what I try to do. But I would imagine that takes a lot of maturity, especially when people are upset about something and maybe make, sure. making accusations that aren't true and mm -hmm. that's hurtful to hear. Yeah. But they are still a person in the community you want to respect like their opinion about absolutely. something. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah, that right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, outside of all that stuff, what are some of your guys' hobbies for fun? You can laugh at us. We've taken up pickleball, and it is so much fun. It's like, I compare it to video gaming, how when I make mistakes, it just makes me mad and want to keep playing to fix that. And when we do well, then, of course, it's fun to keep playing. So, we've been playing with the league at the Swim and Tennis Club on Mondays and Wednesdays when we can make it. and with our friends sometimes on off nights too. So that's been really fun. 
We love to ride our bikes and Josh loves to run. I don't so much love to run. <laughs> and we love to hang out with our family, especially this time of year out on Caesar Creek Lake on our boat, doing water sports and also just going to the pool and spending time with friends there. One of my favorite things about the Clinton Swim Club is that I don't have to plan anything with other moms. It's just like we can show up with our snacks and drinks and my kids are going to be excited to see someone there. And it's not always the same people. So it's like sometimes it's school friends or church friends or rec league or track or volleyball, whatever. Like someone is there who they know and they're almost always happy to be there. And we kind of get this random mix of people to hang out with there. So, yeah. Hiking, yeah. travel, reading, I think are all things we Sitting on the front porch with Colin. Front porch time. <laughs> yeah, right. Do you yeah. have a favorite book? One of the best <laughs> I just <laughs> read was Demon Copperhead yeah. by Barbara Kingsolver. A little gritty as far as it's kind of a harsh story, but so powerfully written about everyday issues, about the opioid crisis, about families, about coal so it's, I think it's set in West Virginia-ish mm -hmm. area, maybe Virginia, but a really well done novel. I recently read, is it The Pioneers? David McCullough wrote about oh. the settling of Ohio, how people moved into Marietta and Chillicothe and settled in this, the founding of Ohio, Ohio University. Universe. That's super interesting. I enjoy reading about local history where I'm living at. David McCullough is an incredible historical writer, easy, fun to read. So that's maybe a recent one that I really enjoyed. But I don't know that I can say I just have a favorite book that I go to. I think I'm reading, again, Dale Carnegie wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People. And there's a new version that's out, so I'm reading through that. And How to I, Lose Friends and Piss people off. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But it's really good. I feel like some of those things, I, I read that chapter and I'm like, oh my goodness, I remember when I read that 20 years ago and I realized some of these things, like I actually apply these things and I couldn't have told you where that came from, but it's because I'm rereading that book and realizing, oh man, that's from 20 years ago. That must have sunk in somewhere deep in my core and I still hold on to it. So that's been kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> So you guys have some kids. How many kids do you guys have? We have four children. <laughs> yeah, think about it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Count. They are you guys... <laughs> 16, <laughs> wow. 14, 12, and 8. And which is your favorite? <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, they will accuse that all day. Oh, yeah, right. of being... <laughs> we just <clears throat> got out of car seats for the first time in 16 years yeah no one has to ride in a car seat really? for the first time in 16 moment. years that feels like a big deal when you're traveling when you're flying you have to have a car seat everywhere you go legally yeah and for safety yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah anything could happen right yeah right so last question about you guys and we'll get into wheelies what's a defining moment of your life that's helped make you who you are or shaped your personality and values it's a good question. I think for me, the time I spent in Southeast Asia, that year of independent travel, of leading short-term teams that were coming over, of just simply becoming aware of how vast our world is, and just, I guess, shaping my own worldview and perspective has really influenced my life in a lot of ways. I'd recommend that to anyone who's raising a family or has children coming out of age. Spend a year abroad. Go somewhere. Get a different perspective on what you have now. You'll never regret it. It'll change your life, and you'll be a different person because of it. I imagine it's like really hard to grow up Amish, which I'm sure is a little bit stricter than just the average person in America. Right. We experience other cultures that are just vastly different from even that. Yeah, Probably for a sure. Huge you know, in some ways, I wonder if it doesn't actually help 
though, because you come from a okay. such a subculture. Okay. And so you're traveling to these other areas. And instead of like just gawking, like you actually have felt like there were you travel back a day into the, you know, some tribal village. And yeah, we were foreigners. But like you almost felt like there was some sort of like common identity, like you're a subgroup. But actually, I'm also from a subgroup. I know what that's like to have right. people come in and like look at you and like tourists come and like take pictures of you. And so I think there was some sort of maybe common ground. I think too, even that English is not his first language, that his family would have spoken a dialect of German at home. And speaking those two languages, I think gives you a perspective to navigate that in another country in a way that would be yeah. unusual for an American. I would say my influence would be that my dad was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was nine and how hard he lived another 30 years, slowly went downhill. He had primary progressive multiple sclerosis, but just the process of him losing his capacities. He didn't live with pain, but just lost his capacity in a lot of different ways. And there were a lot of painful moments in that for us as a family, but I think it's so easy for me to look back now and see like that concept that what the enemy meant for harm, God used for good. So I can look back now and see how much that like made my family of origin tight knit. Like we were all working together to make things work and I had to be responsible and work hard and renegotiate and be flexible in a way that like really made my family so precious to me and maybe helped me to see the world differently. I think anytime you live with a person who's moving through the world in a wheelchair, you never see the world the same because you realize like you have to look for that accessibility everywhere you go, everything you plan, every vacation, you're looking for how that person is going to be able to be with you and navigate, you know. So I feel like it just changes you to have to work through that as a family. It sounds like for both of you, it's just taking outside views and applying that to your everyday life. Mm. Yeah. It shaped us. Yeah, certainly. for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't want to jump too far ahead into no. please, but... Is that maybe a little bit of inspiration for the trashaw bikes? Absolutely. I <laughs> yeah. should have made that connection <clears throat> no, yeah. Yeah. myself verbally that my dad is absolutely in the, the inspiration for Cycling Without Age. And actually the founder of Cycling Without Age had a father with multiple sclerosis too in Copenhagen in the area. Mm -hmm. So as slow as that program feels in some ways that we're like getting our feet under us and moving forward, my dad was a farmer and like he kind of had to back away from the everyday work on the farm, but he still had this little golf cart and every day he'd be like circling around, checking on the crops, come back, report, like check in while somebody's plowing, whatever. That accessibility for people to be able to get outside and see what's going on in the world, to give people a bike ride through the woods on our trails feels like, let's do it. Absolutely. That's an influence from my dad. That's beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> so let's get into wheelies then. What was the inspiration to start a bike shop? The fact that there was no bike shop in Wilmington and we got tired of driving out of town to get parts and to service our own bikes. And it kind of all came together at that property, 171 South Mulberry Street, then when we had purchased it and talked about what to put here. And it just felt like the realization that there's no local competition for a bike shop in Wilmington. You have 20 miles to the next closest bike shop. The fact that the property is adjacent to the trail is a huge benefit for us. People can take test rides, cruise down to the hospital, try things out. And the fact that we saw this model in Europe and in Germany where almost every bike shop has a cafe or a restaurant or something connected to it. And so we talked to our architect who was designing it and kind of threw a couple ideas at him and said, do you think something like this, you could put this together on paper? And he threw us, you know, a couple design options and ideas. And we really just fell in love with the idea of a 
kind of a restaurant and a bike shop flowing together out of that same location. I think those are kind of what made it all come together. Those three things kind of hinge on each other and are what we are hoping ends up being a successful bike shop in Wilmington. I think it's crazy that you have experience in neither a restaurant or a bike shop. And you oh, you're right. Built a building from scratch yeah. <laughs> for those two things. <laughs> it well, is crazy. I think there were times where it felt like I'd wake up at 3 a.m. and realize, man, these people are asking questions about how we want this and this, and I don't even know what they're talking about. So I need to really do some <laughs> research and like, but honestly, the whole way through, I feel like we've been surrounded by such an incredible team of contractors all the way from site work to finish painting. I never felt belittled or ignorant by anyone that we were working with. If I didn't know what they were talking about, I would just say, can you explain that to me and something that I could understand? And people were very gracious in working with us through it all. But I just think the whole way through the project as well, we were fortunate with the group of people we worked with, but also it seemed like every time that we came up against what could have been, you know, a barrier or a door, it just seemed like those doors were opened and all we literally had to do was take the next step or make that connection or walk through that door. And it wasn't anything that's special about myself or us. It was just simply, I think we're at the right time at the right place. And I feel like there's a lot of enthusiasm about the project and it's really humbling to be there and to hear people's positive reactions. And you can sense it when someone walks in the door of the bike shop or the restaurant and you realize that they're here because they want to support a local small business who is willing to take a risk here. And it's really humbling to be on that receiving side now where people are coming in like giving you dollars for the service you're providing. And in return, I think we just want to make sure we're giving people the absolute best customer experience you'll ever have at a bike shop or at a restaurant. And the team that really they're managing the bike shop for us and running the restaurant, they're phenomenal people. I feel like more and more our job is to kind of stay in the background and to help them be successful, but it's not about us. Well, we 100% could not have done it without them. Yeah. Because they bring the expertise to the table. Yeah. So I feel like in some ways we put the framework on the ground and they are what's going to make it fly. But that's one thing I feel like is just one of those things you can't really explain, but the right people came along and partnered with us at the right time and they're exceptional at what they do. Mm. I feel like we literally have geniuses working on bikes in our mechanics shop and you know they're able to figure out and troubleshoot things that I don't even know what those parts are called <laughs> and they're willing to work with us which again is just really humbling to be able to be a part of it. Where did you meet your mechanics that you have in the shop? Well one of them owned a bike shop 20 years ago in Wilmington and someone had told us you should meet these people mm -hmm. they used to own a bike shop in Wilmington so we sat down to have coffee with them they have other jobs but they are helping us after work and that's a huge gift to have that experience that history on our team and then one of our other mechanics came in one day and was like you don't work on bikes here do you and I said yes and he said man, I should put my resume in. I just retired and I'm, I love to work on bikes. And I was like, no, seriously, we would be happy to take your resume. And he's just been gold to us because I would say we have been busier than I anticipated we would be. And so like just having a few extra hands putting lots of hours in, getting people's bikes turned around and back out the door in a timely manner is really such a grace to have them. Yeah, for sure. I feel like you guys, I'm going to project something onto you that you can like <laughs> tell how, all right, how wrong that I am. <laughs> you must have like a really strong belief in yourselves to do this, but also a belief in other people to come alongside you. Again, you didn't know how to like a restaurant. You have no experience. Mm -hmm. I don't think you even had a plan for what that would even be. You just had a space for a restaurant yeah, to be in. Right. So you had to believe in yourself and believe other people. This is going to work. Yeah. I'll speak to that. Okay. Yeah. That's Josh, not me. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
I've learned in being married to him for 19 years that what makes him thrive in life is to bite off more than he can chew and then to figure it out. Like that's fun for him. That stresses me out, but I've learned to just lean into it. It's not that I don't ask questions or say like, I'm pretty afraid that this could happen, but I've learned that he hasn't really like completely driven us off the road. (laughs) And usually he's really calculating where he's putting his faith and what he's risking. And so I've just learned to like trust it and work as hard as I can in the background to support, to prop up, whatever. It's very much not my personality, but he does. There's something very deep down in his core that has a lot of faith that it'll work out. Or, you know, they say that like with children, the number one thing that will determine whether a child is successful or not in life is this concept of grit. Your capacity to fall and still get back up, to keep going, to not let failure or your own weaknesses or whatever hold you back, that's what's going on here, I think. He's just not too proud to make a mistake. He's not too proud to try something new. And I think that it's just a really unique personality that is boxed up in this person. And I'm here for the ride. I often have said in life, I'm just running as fast as I can to try to keep up with him because he's way out there. The most successful people are risk takers. Yeah. So I will admit, though, that like I think it's in a person's DNA at some level, like whether or not you're a risk taker or not. And risk takers can be really messy sometimes or like Mm -hmm. feel threatening to people. In this situation, one thing that's so beautiful to me is this idea that, like, when we're all working together in that building, we feel each other's strengths and weaknesses. But if we all had the same strengths and weaknesses, we wouldn't be flourishing in the same way as just, like, finding ways for everybody to do what they're good at and to have grace for one another when we don't see eye to eye. That's awesome, yeah. (laughs) Well, and one of the things that's a huge gift to us is that these mechanics are willing to train our children. So like our kids are learning bike mechanic skills, and hopefully they're going to be the next generation that cranks those bikes back out. But while they're in the learning process, these experts are coming alongside us and are happy to teach them, which is such a gift to us because it's a skill set that we're not expert in, you know, and so to have an expert there teaching our kids, even just like customer service and kids don't answer phones these days. And so we are realizing like our kids have to learn how to call people and say, your bike's ready to pick up. And I love that our manager pushes them. You need to make this phone call and ask this question of a customer. So that's been an interesting (laughs) process, too. And I feel really grateful for people's like forgiveness or grace toward them when they make mistakes because they're not perfect. They make mistakes. So challenges. What have been some challenges you face so far and how have you overcome these with the bike shop? I know that Josh recently lost his finger. (laughs) Well, most of it. (laughs) Fingernail. My fingernail is gone. But it's for life. Come, I don't know, it's, it's coming trying. back. Oh, okay. We'll see. He's trying. We'll see what comes out of that. <laughs> How did you lose your fingernail construction? I was actually putting together a bike in the basement and the disc brake had a rotor that came around and somehow mm-hmm. I got my finger in one of the holes uh, in the rotor and it wasn't pretty. So that had to have hurt a lot. It, yeah, he passed out cold. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so. That was an obstacle. I'd say. Overcame that one. (laughs) Well, I was going to say, even one of the obstacles, this is really minor, but, you know, we tried to plan a building that we're not going to have big regrets about in six months after it's built. And so, like, kind of maneuvering how to use the space well, which of the spaces are going to be used by the restaurant, How are we going to maximize the space? We're not a huge Mm -hmm. bike shop and we are pushing every foot. You know, how do we use that space? Well, I feel like one thing that could be considered a challenge is there's very little 
information about what people in Wilmington are actually going to buy or need in a bike shop. So this year is going to be a massive year of learning for us about what we need in inventory, what kinds of bikes to buy. I feel like we've been lucky enough to just kind of start slow. We were given the opportunity to go look at inventory for a bike shop that was closing in Powell, Ohio. So we actually took a box truck and bought a box truck full of inventory that really gave us a head start in mechanic stands and tubes and tires and things that we were able to get at a massive discount from them. I mean, like one thing that's been kind of surprising to me is we've sold very few children's bikes. Like I thought, almost every kid rides a bike. Not every adult rides a bike. And maybe that'll change when we get closer to the holidays and people buy bikes as gifts for children. But just we're learning as we go because this is completely new for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I've thought about it when Josh started his own small business with the construction company that turned into Ellis Fence. He had been working for that exact same kind of construction company for years Mm -hmm. ahead of him starting his own company. So he kind of had all these pictures of what he would do differently, what he would do the same. This, I think I told you at a meeting one night, like those first few weeks of the bike shop, I have not felt so ignorant in a long time. There's so much to learn. And just to stay humble and keep your ears and eyes open, apologize, be okay to look stupid because I don't know the name of all these little tiny parts that are on every kind of different bike. There's so much to learn. So like that learning curve is one of our big challenges, I would say. But again, we have an expert in the basement (laughs) or behind the counter who does know those things. But just our personal involvement is that we're not the expert Mm yet. We did talk about this. One of the tickets you guys made is you bought the land. You were going to make condos at first. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Those are kind of been put on hold. So it was like that process. That was the first thing you were going to do, right? Make yeah. these condos. Yeah. yeah. So we were going to build condos. There's space there for six of them. And we were planning to sell them, have an HOA that manages them. And I just feel like, you know, we wanted to build them. They were going to be a little higher end along the trail. And we decided to market them as to try to pre-sell them because I didn't feel like I was willing to take the risk financially to build them and try to sell them. So we thought we'll market these at their up and coming, pre-sell them. And if we get half of them sold, that'll be a pretty good indicator to continue with the project and build them. And we had one contract where we had one pre-sold and just felt like the price point was probably higher than where the market was at the time. And it just felt like it was too big of a risk. So we kind of backed out of that. We're still calling that phase two. There's a lot of different things we could do with that section of the property, but we're in no big rush. We're in no hurry to build those. I feel like we have time and let's get the front side of things moving and profitable and see what we want to invest in in the back part, whether it's two years or 10 years or whatever down the road, but residences could work there. The zoning for the property is DT, downtown transition. So both residential and commercial use can be done at that property right now. So we have options. I just feel like I haven't felt a strong urge to dive into another project right now. So yeah, I can imagine. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm happy to be wrapping things up on this one. So that's cool that as someone who's more of a risk taker that you decided to maybe not take that risk right now. Yeah, I think I've told people this was the most extensive project I think we've ever gotten into where we were GCing it and building it and planning it. So I've told a few people that I think once this is done, I'm not sure I'm going to get into anything big like that ever again. And they all just laugh at me and say, oh, two months after you're done, you're going to be started. Oh, so, uh, I don't know about that. Well, we'll see. Yeah, all right. <laughs> we'll see. that again. Now you have all the people coming, though. You could, like, put a big banner in the parking lot saying, like, here's what could happen here. Yeah, like, right. Your mm-hmm. spot. Well, or I think that sometimes, like, being able to do the commercial building first kind of lets people trust us, like, see our vibe there 
and say like, oh, this is a quality built building. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of condo we would build, you yeah. know, something along right. those lines. I think if we go down that road, we'd probably take some of the amenities away that we were offering in the condos initially and get the price point lower and then have those amenities as options where if you really want to have these, you could add them on, but could have a base price where you have the options to do some add-ons versus starting with a higher end one and mm -hmm. not being able right. to meet the price point that people are expecting. Yeah, for sure. Housing is high in demand though, so that's still a good market. I know, that feel too, like demand is high and I think they would sell, but we'll see. One thing at a time. Well, yeah, right. 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 I think if we had done this project at any other time in our lives, it would have been much more overwhelming than it was, but our children are growing up. And in some ways, we've just talked about it kind of coming at the perfect time. We both grew up on farms where there's like endless work to do. And it teaches you how to be diligent, keep working, to do kind of mindless work over and over and to learn to do it well every day. And one of the things that's been a huge value for us is just this opportunity for our kids to work and to learn a skill. Our oldest works elsewhere because he can drive. But for our youngest three, like, they whine a lot about it, but I feel like we did too on the farm. So like <laughs> it, it's the nature of learning to work. How to work. Yeah. yeah. Air conditioning as well. Yeah. Yeah. For right. real. <clears throat> so that's been an asset there that maybe I didn't quite see coming in the way that it's panned out. I think it's cool because, I mean, a lot of kids' parents have jobs. Right. But how many kids get to like go to work with their parents and see how hard they have to work to like provide a living? It's just like, you mm -hmm. know, just seeing that is probably a great yeah. kids. good perspective for them yeah. yeah i hope okay so last question this one is just about stigmas or rumors so i like to say that you're not a leader unless you've been misunderstood what's something you've heard about yourself or the business <laughs> online or in the community that isn't true that's made you laugh that you want to address <laughs> i don't really hang on to stuff like that like yeah i think if somebody has a specific question or something they want to ask i'm happy to talk through like oh that was a misunderstanding like this is actually how it is but i can't really think of any one specific i will say uh, loosely that there have been some accusations that there's like that intersection of you're on city council you own another small business mm -hmm. you're doing this to line your own pocket everyone's doing it to line their own pocket right that's why we work we work sure. to support ourselves and i think it's fine that people say that kind of thing, but let's just talk about the fact that we live in a really small town when it comes down to if you're going to be on city council, is it a problem to also have a small business mm -hmm. in town? You should want someone to have more Local responsibility. Roots, yeah. Right. My kids go to school here. We work here. We go to church here. He sits on city council here. Those things are going to overlap, and yeah. I do not see it as a negative. Now, for what it's worth, he's not doing work for the city with Ellis Fence while he's sitting on city council just to keep things clean. Has he lost some business for that? Absolutely. But I think that there have been some loose accusations about that. Kind right. Of thing. I think if I feel any hint of this could potentially be a conflict, though, I see it's much easier for me just to completely back out of it and if it's with Alice fence just tell our estimator or whoever like we're not doing this project and you know i just think if you have any doubts or feelings like oh boy i hope this isn't an issue then you're probably better just to back out of it and abstain from it right, right. like this really isn't worth tarnishing you know your reputation or company and i just want to be above board and if there's a chance of there being a conflict just back out of it yeah i think what motivates us is that we care about our city and we want to try to make a difference in things that are practical but then when you're involved in a couple of different things just being cognizant of those overlaps and what you should use integrity in and just back out of i guess would maybe be something people would have questioned but if somebody says things on whether it's social media or people have conversations, I feel like I'm pretty open. Like if you want to ask me questions, I want to be approachable and you can talk or gossip or make up stuff if you want, but it doesn't really affect me. I'm here. Just let me know if 
I need to clean something up. I'll clean up my mess if I need to. <laughs> yeah. There's this quote that I kind of like. It's like, uh, people are going to misunderstand you no matter what you do. So just do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's right? such a people guess. like, someone is going to misinterpret your motives about right. something. And you're such an ambitious person and you care yeah. about the community. You care about having a business. You care about yeah. like policies and the government. So yeah. like, obviously, some of that much ambition is going to be involved with a lot of things. Yeah. And it's easy for someone who's more negative and skeptical sure. to sit back and be like, oh, Josh is doing this or that yeah. for this reason. And it's yeah. like, no, he's just a good guy. He's very ambitious. Yeah. Like, good for him, you know? There's definitely times when they'll be misunderstood. But then even just taking the time to try to clean that up, to not just walk away and say, well, you guys are morons. You don't know. Like, just if there is a misunderstanding, I'll try to take the time and explain it and clean that up if I can. But yeah. I also don't want to just spend my life doing damage control. And yeah got to keep moving so <laughs> that's true some people will understand some people won't so yeah yep. right say your piece and they don't get it carry on, carry carry on. on. Like, yeah. <laughs> for sure yeah okay last bit philosophy so why is it important for you to do what you do and with Lily is and what keeps you passionate if any like proudest moments that you've had so far I think it, it, this is back to some of what we had talked about before but it does make me really proud when I see my son educating someone about e-bikes or you know we have a customer in the shop and he walks them through taking a test ride on a few different bikes and educating them about the different models and styles and brands whatever and I realize he's learned that recently and he's growing into those shoes so I think that some of those moments make me feel really grateful for the project I also think like man Jen Perky and Brad Hayes are geniuses at what they do. Of course, it's a huge advantage to us to have them there because they're already well-known in this community. They're doing really well already outside of this project. And so for them to come do another location and a new feel in a new restaurant, I think those first few days that they had customers in the building we have walked from home one night and we're coming down there and to see people on the patio eating and just to see Brad and Jen thriving and these people working, that feels like, I'm not sure that it's really a proud moment so much as just like the fulfillment of a dream and how satisfying it is to have jumped through all those hoops, worked to get to the end and now kind of like to sigh. I know that just in the past few months, we felt a little bit like that sense of like, you built a homemade airplane and we're really hoping it's going to actually take flight. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, both businesses are launched and that feels like a huge relief that we got things off the ground. You know, it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here, but them both being fully launched now feels like pretty amazing. You're finally getting to bring what you sewed. Yeah. And he 100% did most of the work, <laughs> mm. <laughs> to be fair. It's cool that yeah. it's not just a project, but it seems like it's like a platform. Like you got to see your kids thrive and you see other businesses thrive. That's yeah. Cool. It's awesome. That was maybe something I didn't quite expect when I purchased the property. But as you know, that was three years ago. And as we've moved through the planning and then design and then building and having the kids be involved and mm. our oldest is 16 now and they're all kind of taken a certain sense of like ownership and even talk about like what do you think they'll put on the menu and just knowing that they've spent a good bit of their last three years helping with this project is really rewarding and it's really i tell her too like i feel like these last few weeks with the um, trail house opening and with the bike shop being open it just feels really rewarding to just be a fly on the wall mm -hmm. and sit at a back corner and not even be really anyone and just watch it all flow. Like people walk in, they're ordering food, they're sitting at tables having conversations. There's bikes that are coming in and out, people walking, families using the trail. I think what you dreamed of, and I feel like it's really rewarding to just sit for an hour and just kind of watch it move and kind of take a shape of its own. And Yeah. 
I say two things about the bike shop, like some of the most satisfying things about the bike shop for me are to see a kid who comes in on a bike that's way too small for them. They've grown out of their bike and to get them test riding a bike that fits them and watch them tear down the trail with their legs stretched out and they can go so much faster because it's a bigger, more ambitious bike than what they've been on. And to see how that makes them feel, yeah. you know, like that they're growing up. And the other thing is, it's so satisfying to me to watch people bring in these bikes from their basements and their barns, their garages that they haven't been able to ride because something's broken or a tire's flat. And they come in and get it fixed and we see them using it on the trail. Like some of that is just like a convenience issue. If you have to drive 20 minutes or 30 minutes to a bike shop twice to take your bike in, wait for it to get fixed, come back in two weeks. There's just a convenience factor that might keep you off a bike for a couple of years because, or 20 years because there's no bike shop in town. Mm -hmm. So like to see people back on bikes and like one of our core motivations is to get people outside moving and connected to other people. So when we see that happening on the trails, and we had a little part to help that happen. It feels really satisfying. Yeah, for sure. When we interviewed Bruce, he was talking about how important your business is and how it's impacting the trail's success. They have been incredibly supportive, the Trails Coalition. And we are so happy to work together with them. They have been working for a long time. So I'm just happy to be part of the process for them. Yeah, I think one of his goals was like, yeah, make our community healthier, change the culture a bit. Having you here definitely supports that dream of his. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. What's a piece of wisdom or maybe a life philosophy that's helped guide you that you would like to share with other people? I would say a quote I often say out loud is, and I can't remember who said it, but if everyone would sweep his own stoop, the whole world would be clean. I talk about the idea too. Josh always talks about the snowball is going to roll one direction or the other. And we're here to push the snowball in one direction. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the little things that you do on a daily basis or in a year, they add up in a community. So focusing on the negative things that happen in a community can really snowball. I'm not here to listen long and hard to the negative things in our community. I want to find the things that are going well, and help push that snowball in the right direction. Because if we all do a little sweeping, if we all do a little work, it really adds up as a community. Wilmington is a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. There are a lot of people who don't believe that, who live here. And I feel like I'm here to help people believe that because I absolutely think it's true. Yeah, definitely take personal responsibilities. Really mm -hmm. good your own section yeah. of the community. Yeah, I think that's what I thought of too. Personal responsibility, I think is something that drives me. I think it's a foundation too for like yeah. social responsibility. Yeah. You have to like mend your own house. If your budget's out of control, like you're not right. able to get other people. So like it starts with personal responsibility and that yeah. flourishes over into social responsibility, I guess. Right. Yeah. Even with politics, I think that was kind of like the very beginning of the conversation for us is we were on vacation and reading the local paper about how many seats were going to be open on city council. And we just discussed like those people make a lot of decisions in our city and young people need to like step up to the plate. It takes some work to campaign and to put yourself out there because you will be attacked. But these people who've been doing those things for a long time, huge gratefulness to them. We need young people to step up to the plate. And I think our generation feels pretty jaded about politics at a national level, at a local level. And I just think it's not going to change unless people step into the ring and don't just feel like they're so stupid. Politics is a joke. OK, you can say that. That doesn't fix anything. There's a really famous poem. It is not the critic who counts. Yes. Yeah. It's not the critic who counts. It's the person who steps into the ring yeah. and is sweated out, bloodied, bludgeoned, who actually makes a difference. It's a lot easier to stand and be a critic. But what really counts is the people who get in the ring. I read this 
the other day, Hemingway, it is good to have an end to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end. I thought that one kind of resonated with me that each day is a gift. Make the most of it. Acknowledge that you're on a journey here. You're a different person today than you were 10 years ago. You're going to be a different person 10 years from now than you are today. You're going to have different ideas and perspectives and ambitions. And your life is probably going to be very different 10 years from now than it is today. But embrace and enjoy the journey because that's what we have to look back on as we go through life too and make the most of your days. Don't be a miserable person, but look on the bright side and enjoy the good things you have going for yourself for today. And don't get too caught up about what tomorrow might bring because tomorrow is going to have its own set of struggles and worries. So live in the moment, enjoy the journey. There's always going to be things to criticize or new things to want to achieve. So yeah, enjoy. Yeah, right. So what's the vision you have for our community or something you like to see in Wilmington? I can say right up front, I listened to your podcast with Bruce and I love the idea that we would actually get a full loop trail that kids could pretty easily hop on that trail and ride a bike to school. The other thing is public education, man. I care a lot about that. And I just believe it's in every one of our best interests to give the best education we can to every kid in this city. I mean, we have a rocking homeschool coalition. We have a strong program out at Wilmington Christian Academy. Our city schools are a great place to be. They don't look great in the ratings, and I would love to see that change. I would love Wilmington City Schools to be one of the best in the nation. That would be a dream come true to me. Of course, it may not directly impact my own children yet in my next few years, but for our grandchildren, for the next kids who are coming down the line, I think Wilmington City Schools has a really strong history, and maybe we've just hit a little bit of a bump in the road I would love to see it get better, to see it just be a shining example of what educating the next generation can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I think safe, clean, beautiful downtown area, prosperous, where businesses are acknowledging that there's something special happening here and they want to be doing business here, where people want to come here for a weekend getaway, that we have amenities and are an attractive place that families want to live in and raise their families in are all things I hope and dream for for our city and our community. And I think eliminating heroin and the drug epidemic, getting people freed from addictions and strongholds that are in their life that they just can't break on their own, finding ways to truly help those who need help and not necessarily just another handout, but really freedom for people who need it would be a dream come true as well. Finding ways to have people say, you know, this is where I was. And because of the help I was able to receive in this community, I'm a changed person. Yeah. And I think I have hope for that as That's well. It's one of my prayers when I pray for Wilmington is that those accusations that say, People are bringing those people to our city. I want us to have the reputation that people get free here. People come here and they get the resources. They get the hand out sometimes in order to get the hand up to literally not be in a dark place in their life anymore. That people would across the nation hear, I got free in Wilmington, mm -hmm. not just spiritually, but physically from addictions, what he just said. I would love for that to be our reputation. I think we're on the way. It's maybe not super dramatic yet. Good things take time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if people want to get in contact with you, how would they do that? Sure. Our bike shop website is wheeliesbikes.com. That's probably the first place I would send you or stop in, get lunch at Trailhouse. Do you have set hours yet? We are open 11 to 5, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Thursdays, we're open late, so 11 to 7. Saturdays, we're just open 9 to noon. That could change in time. Our hours are on our website, too. Awesome. Yeah, check out our website. Terry runs our social media page. 
So follow us on social media. There's a lot of information there to tap into as well as far as bikes and brands. And there's walks that are happening weekly. So if one of those fits your schedule, jump in on that. And we're hoping we get a ride scheduled, a weekly ride for people to hop on a bike and ride down to Ogden and back as well. So as we keep having those things, we'll keep adding them to social media and our website. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing our podcast. Thanks Thanks for having us. us. Always good to be with you. All right. Well, that's it for our podcast today, folks. Hope you enjoyed our interview with Josh and Terry Slable over at Wheelies on Mulberry Bike Shop. If you have more questions for them or have questions you ask in a different way, feel free to reach out to them directly. They're typically around the bike shop every now and then or getting food at Trail House. Mm -hmm. So if they'll talk to us two dorks, they'll certainly talk to you as well. After all, we are a community of empowered individuals. So to your people who reached out to Real Change Wilmington, how would they do that? You can contact us on our website at realchangewilmington.com, visit our Facebook and Instagram pages, or grab a free copy of our local newspaper at Kroger, Sam's Meats, and Fiesta Vera Cruz. We also currently send our newspaper direct mail to over 2,500 Wilmington residents, so if you want to help us cover our printing costs and advertise your local business, event, or job posting, please email us at advertise at realchangewilmington.com. Very cool. With that, I'm your host, Dustin Pierce. And I'm your co-host, Tia Harris. Keep it real, Wilmington. Wilmington.